Well, we are live here with the doggy experts. Welcome to our monthly Ask the Doggy Experts Live. I'm here with Jessica George, and we are excited to be back with you here this evening. Uh, we have not seen you all in a little while. It's been a little bit over a month or so since we've seen you. So um, excited to have you jump back in and join us this evening. Um, thank you all. Um, I do want to just go ahead and um, find out how many dogs have you owned? For those of you that are getting on here, how many dogs have you owned in your lifetime? Uh, this is an interesting question, especially for, for us. You two probably should start counting because I, 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 I can already tell you. Well, I've owned, that's, I've owned 54. 54 dogs. 54 dogs, seven of which, which were wolves, actually. So. Okay. That's that's a pretty substantial number there. 54 dogs. Anybody anybody beat that? No. A few of you on here. It's, you must only have one dog if you haven't commented yet. Uh, yeah, four. Okay, there we go. Elizabeth. All right, that's Elizabeth. Four dogs. That's pretty good. Jessica, how about you? How many dogs have you had? Counting the three that we have now, 24. 24. I'm going from like childhood, you know, like we had this little dog named Gidget when I was growing up, but from, from Gidget to right now, there's 24. 24 is pretty, pretty good number. I think you both actually have me beat. And I thought I was the crazy one. <laughs> Seriously. I was like, Oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst. Like I've had the most, the most dogs. No, definitely not. I think I've only had like 15. Um, but it's been in a fairly short period of time, I suppose. So I don't know. Well, don't there know. there is a period of time where, when I was living in Connecticut, I did a lot of work with a local um, like rescue up there and trying to foster dogs. And Andrew, I was the worst when I was single and not a mom. I was the worst foster fail ever because I was just like, and now I have eight dogs all at one time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I'll never forget going to going to somebody's house to train their dog on the invisible fence, and she was worked with a rescue group as well, and same same thing except for yeah. she had thirteen dogs living in the wow. house, and I was like, we're hmm. borderline not hoarding, but it's not not too far away from that. Uh, well, I I always figure it's better to be a crazy dog lady than a crazy cat lady. I don't know. I just do better with dogs. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, lots of, lots of time there with those dogs. So, um, George, yep. you're in the dark there. You just, uh, finishing up some, some lessons there. Yep, and, I just uh, finished Marley and then at eight o'clock I got another one coming in. George had a Marley tonight. It's yes. like a Marley and me. Well, Marley's about probably a good 70 pound rock solid pit bull who's just awesome. I love, I love and Marley. His biggest thing is he loves so much, he's barreling granny over. Uh -oh. So I, you know, he just wants to love everybody. And daddy's taught him to jump on him by horsing around, of course. So I had to teach him how to get back, go to play, stay there while they answered the door tonight. So we were, we accomplished that. So they have their, their chores ahead. And I said, from now on, you tell Granny, wait until the dog's in place. So. Easier said than done. Yep. <laughs> Easier said than done. I don't yeah, know. I Granny can only lead want the to way. The you know what I mean? I can only show them the way. So. That's, this is true. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink, That's right? <laughs> That's so funny. Well, cool. So, um, I thought we would uh, touch on something. I was I was doing a little reading earlier, and um, I ran into uh, just a little little information, if you will. And I thought it'd be fun it, fun to talk about where people's dogs sleep at night. Um, where where do your dogs sleep? Um, I think this is gonna get this is gonna get this is like. Um, you know where you take your car like you see the mechanic and the mechanic his car is busted. yes this is what this is oh, what no, 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 no. Uh, be prepared folks that uh, -huh. uh the truth is about to come out here so where it's not as bad call... as you think okay. no so so i'll go little little buckshot who for those of, of everybody who doesn't know who buckshot is he's a 
He's 13. He's a social media superstar. Yeah, he, he pretty much, everybody should know who Buckshot is at this point. But um, for those of you who don't know, Buckshot is a, he's 13 and a half pounds now because I weighed him on Saturday after he got his haircut by Lupe, by the way, who did a fantastic job. Shout out to Doggy Zone Groomers. Um, Buckshot does sleep in the bed most of the night because he's tiny. He's little. He curls up in a tiny little ball like right behind my legs. And it's just, he's a fun little bed dog. Like he's cool. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so you've got one in the bed. Where are the, George, where, where are the rest of the dogs? You, where they belong they, down in their kennel runs. In their, in their runs, in their kennel yes. runs. There you go. So the oh, survey, I'll, right I'll, tell, I'll tell you my dogs, we have four dogs in my house and, um, they are three young labs, so two two-year-olds and one three-year-old, and then we have our little our little pit bull mix, and yeah. she she's like a cat, so she doesn't really count as a dog. But we're for the purpose of this conversation, we'll say she's a dog, and she does sleep in the bed. And then we have one other Labrador who sleeps in the bed, and so that's me, two dogs, and a pregnant wife. It's a tight bed. Uh, we probably could use a, a larger bed going forwards, but that's all right. And then our, the other two Labradors are in their crates. But um, I'm curious from our, our audience who's on here watching right now, if you'd go ahead and do me a quick favor, just type into the chat bar, uh, where is it that your dog sleeps? I want to do a real quick survey to see how many of you uh, have your dog sleeping in the bed because I want to see if it's uh, in line with what it is that I learned earlier. The right. percentage of people who have their dog sleep in the bed is about 45%. I, I can see that. What if I told you that dog trainers, it's even higher than that? Yeah. <laughs> years dog ago, trainers, of course. Years ago, <laughs> your dog's are perfect, George. On one, of the, on one of the old pro trainers email lists, I did a survey, okay? And the, I did it twice. It was, it was a six-month survey. So the first question I asked was, how many of you – these are pro trainers advise that the owners don't sleep in bed with the dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was like 78%. Really? That said you shouldn't do that. Yeah. I followed up exactly six months later and asked this question. How many of you sleep in bed with your dog? 78%. <laughs> True story. I, I believe it 100%. I believe so it. It's, a, it's a case of do as I say, not as I do. Uh, 100%. 100%. Well, Brad, Buck actually slept in his crate last night. We got a few people on here that are saying crate here more than I Good. more than I was expecting. It's actually starting to look <laughs> a little 50-50 here. Good for you, Milton. Sleeps in his bed next to my bed. Good job, Milton. Doggy's own family. I see a couple of you on here hanging out with us. Thanks for jumping on and joining us. Hey, Carly. <laughs> we got our, our general manager, one of our other trainers jumping on here with us. Um, so, you know, why is it that we have this conversation? Why? And, and I'm not going to say us, but let's just say dog trainers as a general, a general rule right now. What? What's the reason? Why is it that most dog trainers tell people don't let your dog sleep in the bed? What's the myth or what's the concern or what's the what's the real reason for that? You want me to take that, Jess? Yeah, go go ahead and start because I actually had somebody ask me today, but you go ahead and I'll piggyback on it. All right. It's really about the concept of what's called denning. Yeah. Okay. Um, within the den, if you have a large group of pack, the leader tends to get the highest and the driest spots within the den. And it goes down the hierarchy. It's where they're all cuddled up in there. That's really kind of packed in to the Omega, which is the bottom dog in the group, tends to be at the near the entrance. It serves as an alert dog as well as keeps the rest of them warm because it's blocking all the weather. Okay? Now here's the problem with allowing... It's not a problem, but here's the potential issue of allowing your dog to sleep in your bed. It's high up, it's dry, and it's comfortable. And you're allowing that dog, in theory, on the same level as you. 
Now, how are you going to build any like positioning there? And I'm not talking about being dominant. That, that's a myth. But how are you going to build any position if you're treating that dog as an absolute equal for eight, nine hours a day? Okay. Now, why can we get away with it? Because if he steps out of line in any way within that bed, we'll call him on it. Right. Okay. Most people won't. I've worked many cases over the years where the dog will actually claim a particular spot on the bed and then hubby or mommy comes to bed. The dog's growling at him and threatening them for having the audacity to disturb them and try to move them from their spot. And then they'll tell me while well, they're telling me this story, but he's a good dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We need to talk. So it's really what I told, I just told a family, Marley's family, actually, tonight, I was just telling them, I said, where's he sleep? I thought for sure they were going to tell me in bed because how he is. Mm -hmm. and she said, he said, no, he sleeps on his bed on the floor next yep. to the bed. I said, awesome. You know, and uh, that's perfect. He understands his position within this. See, it's a positioning thing. It's, it's subtle. You don't have to tell him to be there he just assumes he's lower and that's kind of good because they're going to tend to follow a higher up if that makes sense yep but i've had cases in the past where dogs have actually attacked a family you know a spouse coming to bed uh, i had a lady once who was very severely uh she was a single woman but she had this little schnauzer that tore her up while she was asleep because she rolled over and disturbed him and he gave her a disciplinary bite right square on the face. Jeez. You see, that's a relationship issue. And that's where I'm coming from when I discourage. Now, some people, I just say, hey, I don't care where he sleeps. You call me if it's causing a problem. Right. Because I'm not I'm not that control freak, you know, type of yeah. You know, if you're happy and the dog's happy, it's your bet. You know, I don't know why you do that. You got a perfectly good wife over there to sleep, you know, to cuddle up with. But that's just me. But if if it's causing a problem, an issue, hey, the dog's growling at me when I crawl over. The dog's growling at my husband or wife. Yeah, we need to we need to address that now. And that bed is going to be a, a no for the current time being. So. Well, I, I look back, George, I look back to like the whole reason. I mean, there's a slew of reasons that we, you know, ended up bringing uh, Tater Tot, the French Bulldog, into the home um, versus going back to the to the rescue organization that he came from. And there was a lot of those kind of like resource guarding tendencies on the bed, on the couch, on the recliner, where he was just owning everything that he was on. I mean, I think back, it's it was probably about eight months to a year before I even allowed Tater to come up on the couch to watch TV. Like he wasn't there yet. Yeah. And then we get, and then of course we have Raven who just never settles down. She's on the so couch the right now. By the way. Bed is because she crazy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Hence the reason why my two Labradors are created at night as well. Right. She, yes, never... she won't settle. She just got to love you. And she's all elbows and, you know, feet, and, you know, and she's big and we love her, but no. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I think you have to teach some etiquette, right? There's yeah. some etiquette to the dog being allowed into the bed. So I like to teach them when to get into bed. Yeah. So that's basically when I tell you hop, you can, mm -hmm. you can jump into the bed. If I tell you off, you must get up and leave the bed yeah. And I think that if you train those things, uh -huh. I think sure. that it can work out fine. I uh, think it always be a lot of relationship. Yeah. I, I, I think someone once told me what you allow is what you, will occur. Gee, where'd you hear that? I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a, a big, big issue with it. It's one of those yeah. things where you just kind of, can let it go. And if it becomes, starts to become an issue, then, then deal with it. And right. just know that the way that we deal with it is pretty simple. <laughs> You're no longer allowed in the bed for a yeah. while until, until we uh, get some clarity. So right. exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a thing. So we're not going to tell you, no, you can't sleep with your dog, you know? No, but there might be some advice. Dog. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, there might be some advisement. I think about it not to throw my my own child under the bus, but um, every once in a while, you know, like Buck will go to Bradley's bed at nighttime. He'll read to him and it's fine. And, you know, a, you know, past couple of weeks, there's been like a random like low bearing growl going on. And I'm like, Bradley, what did you do? Get him off your bed, you know, so you know, when dealing with dogs, and that's part of it as, as parenting and trying to teach a, a child. I mean, he'll be 10 soon. Like, like Andrew, you and I were just talking about, um, he's matured so much in his, in his age and his handling, but you know, just being, being a parent with dogs, you still have to manage that, especially with dogs and kids. And I would add this to the parents out there, just so you know, most Fights on children happen in an, on an elevated surface, i.e. Yep. on the couch, on the chair, on the dog bed, or on the bed. Yep. That's where most of them occur. They don't happen out in the yard as much as that happens when the kid jumps on the couch where the dog's been allowed and gives them a big hug and gets popped in the face. Or they disturb the dog while it's laying upon its bed. You can see how this thing can be important, the den of it. You know, yeah. but sleeping dogs lie is an old saying and it's an old saying for a reason, yep. you know, so. Yeah, I can't remember the exact statistic, but at some point, I think I read that 50% uh, of kids will be bitten by a dog by the age of 12. Yep. That's, that's probably about exactly. right. You know? So now whether that's do. a serious, you know, go to the hospital bite or not, I think that the important thing for us to keep in mind there is the mental and emotional impact yep. that that has on that human being for the probably the rest of their life and, and being able to trust dogs. So I think that there's a lot of, there's a real responsibility for parents to um, teach their kids how to properly engage and interact with dogs and to really kind of, I don't like saying protect your kids, but almost, you know, protect your kids from doing protect something. Kids. Don't, there's no they, lying about they, it. They they might for the rest of their you know life. what I always kids. say, they never get rid of the kid. The right. dog pays a hundred percent of the time too. You know, yeah. and I, a lot of times it ends up out of the home or worse. Yeah. So there, um, there, if you love that dog as much as you tell me you love that dog, because everybody tells me how much they love their dog then don't put it in a position where it's going to put you in a position where you got to make it go away. Yeah. yeah I, I think in the, in the past year and a half um, I've done two instances with, with clients that they have um, daughters in Girl Scout troops. So I've done a couple of different where I've had like a Girl Scout troop come in um, on a, on a Saturday afternoon to earn their pet, bat, their pet safety badge and just being able to go over like, handling of the dogs or how to greet the dogs and little different things like that has been a great thing to just like have outreach of community. Um, even in Bradley's Cub Scout troop, we've done a couple of things like that as well. Just like education with parents and kids. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's not a, enough of it. And, you know, I kick myself a little bit because uh, probably about 10 years ago now I purchased a, bite prevention program for kids um, that I was planning to do at elementary schools um, where we go in and we teach, you know, elementary school classrooms of kids um, how to how to behave around dogs and how to, you know, prevent getting bitten. Yeah. Um, and it's just you know, I did that for like 10 years. Yeah. Well, I remember, system. Yeah. I remember when you, you were doing some of that, I think I remember going to one or two yeah. of them with you and um, doing some career days and things like that. And I think we've, I think just, you've done them now. And I, I think yeah, we've I've, all I've done one at, at Bradley school and then his daycare center a couple of years ago. Yeah. I actually enjoy doing that stuff. The problem is scheduling doesn't permit it anymore, you know, but it's really a good thing. Yeah, and we will get back to it. I think that it's likely that um, with our expansion, for those of you guys that I guess don't pay any attention at all because it's pretty much been said everywhere. Uh, I, I know, brutal, brutal, but seriously, there's we, we've been we've been definitely letting people know. Uh, but with our expansion that's going on next door, I know we'll be doing some more educational seminar. Type the outreach, stuff. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, when we do that, I mean that's definitely something for us to think about. 
um, is maybe bringing that bite prevention program back into play. And, um, you know, hey, maybe we could do a little something like that on one of our calls here too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how many how many of you on the call right now have a kid that's under the age of 12. Um, well, uh, Jessica, <laughs> <laughs> George. Um, yeah, just got him, brand new, fresh. Mine's not born yet, but. It'll be there, Andrew. He will be there soon. So I guess I can raise my hand as well for that. Um, so yeah, we we'll have to we'll have to play around with that, but just you know, I, I think it's just a great point. Um, you know, parents, you should definitely make sure that you're you're doing education with your kids about how to properly interact and engage with dogs, protect them for that first first twelve years of their life where they're they're likely to get bitten by a dog, so that they don't have that negative experience. Because once they do, it can be very difficult to change that. And that's actually a great uh, little segue for us to maybe. Yeah into is, you know, I'm, I'm curious for you all, somebody who has a fear of dogs um, and the dog is not fearful of them, how do you handle that? You know, how how is that, how do you best approach that when the party that's fearful of the dog does actually live with the dog and we want to be able to get them together? It's not like we're having a friend over where we're going to just say, okay, well, we'll just not have the dog around you and, and that type of thing. What do you think? I mean, what's, what's the best thing to do there? Cause if this is, is, is get them involved with training mm -hmm. with the other family members and then bring them in easily to do maybe a few of the simple exercises. Once they, uh, they get the hang of it and they start seeing some results. I find that they usually start loosening up a little bit. The trick is, is to have that done under the watchful eye of somebody that can see something developing way early so you can prevent the you know the uh the, the backslide at the wrong moment you know what i mean yep. you have to you yep. need to really do that you know, that's not something you do willy-nilly i'd be very cautious as to how much i let them go in and how you know where i took i would lead that very carefully but you can't make you know you got to remember dogs and humans you can't train emotion right you know you can only change behavior so uh you know some of that stuff so deep-seated there's nothing you're going to do you know yeah. to, to, to create a you know a dog someone that loves dogs anyway but you can get them to tolerate it and then there's also management that could be done i've i've had to deal with that several times for, for clients you know where hey daddy wants this German Shepherd, Malinois, Doberman mix, and mama says no. And so I said, well, here, daddy. I said, get your wallet out and build a kennel. I said, you keep the dog in the kennel. And when you're home, you take care of the dog and you do this and you do that. And this your dog, you know, don't expect mama to do nothing. It works, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, we had a question that came in here. I missed, I just want to go ahead and get it up here in a pack of two to three dogs. How do you tell which dog is alpha versus omega for our pups? Oh. Get on oh. So George, I oh, saw that. Have it. Yes. Right. We're giving this to George. All right. Ain't no dog in your house. It should be alpha. Okay. If you, you know, if you're dog, here's the thing. If you have to tell your dog, you're the alpha, you're not. So, um, you know, you're negotiating at that point. Okay. Don't get stuck on the alpha thing. Okay. Most people I know, including most professional trainers I know, wouldn't know an alpha canine if it bit them on the butt. The alpha doesn't have to tell anybody they're alpha. They just are. And it's obvious if you know what you're looking for. So none of those puppies are alpha. They're the puppies of the house, and they'll do as you say. Was who was that? Uh, I didn't. I don't see the chat. Uh, who's the? Customer? It was uh, the Samoyeds. Oh yeah, you. They, I'm gonna get them in class. <laughs> you the alpha, if you need to use that term. Fair the enough. Dogs aren't writing any checks. They're just eating stuff. <laughs> Office level <laughs> platter, right? Oh, they walked right into that one. <laughs> so, hey, I want to dive into another uh, another 
question here about teaching hand signals. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have been getting much questions around this, but I had somebody ask me this the other day during a uh, during a lesson about, you know, how should I teach hand signals? And, you know, pretty much what I explained to him was that I don't teach hand signals. And the only reason why I don't is because I find that for the average person that I'm tending to work with, um, they are really just learning how to train dogs. So when you're just beginning to learn how to train dogs, trying to get your timing down, trying to use the right commands consistently with the same movements is challenging enough. Yeah. And then to get somebody to do that on top of adding a hand signal to it. And God forbid. Leash. Yeah. It really, it makes it much more challenging for people to learn, but I'm not against them. I think that they're, I think they're really valuable because obviously dogs communicate through body language. So by using hand signals, we create more clarity in our communication to the dog. But um, I've always kind of felt like you're going to do it. You need to kind of commit to it. Um, otherwise, it, it's really not going to be right. valuable if you're not really consistent with it early on. Yeah. I think a common mistake in training, and somebody doesn't have to agree with me, is a lot of people and trainers will tend to try to couple the verbal with a hand signal while they're teaching. Mm. And I wholly disagree with that approach. And because if you could combine them and you're throwing a command and the dog's not watching you, they won't necessarily do the command. Right. Because they're not that, you know, they're coupled it with that sit, for instance, raising your hand, very common one. Um, so if you're going to teach them, I really highly recommend you train them as separate exercises, you know? Um, and then if the dog's looking at you and you throw both, it's not a big deal, but if they're not looking at you, put it this way, you know, if Raven's on a dead run away from me and I yell, sit, she sits, right? She ain't looking at me while she's running away. You see what I mean? But if I had only taught it by going sit with a treat every time, I don't, you all can't see me. I'm in my truck. But anyway, you're raising your hand. If I yell sit and she doesn't see that that body language part, she probably won't sit. Because right. Because it's not set up that perfect way, you know. You've so changed I like the, teaching the, the, right. the verbals separate from the hand signals completely. Uh, that's just me. So. I, I think especially in just to kind of mirror in and walk the progression with um, just say the university program at Doggy Zone, for example, um, I'm not necessarily starting any hand signals until the dog's going to any sort of distance, right? So in the high school level, when we're starting to get the dog to do position switches from sits to downs, that it's not until that fourth level of the program that we're trying to teach that, you know, slide the hand up on the leash to mimic that upward, upward pressure, you know? So in the beginning stages of training, Andrew, you're right. When you're trying to fumble with the verbiage, the body language, the treat delivery, the leash hold, I, I'm not worried about what hand is telling the dog what. Yeah, I will say though, you know, I um, I didn't do a lot of hand signals with um, my last couple dogs, and um, I will say that in their older age, I kind of regretted that a little bit mm -hmm. because as I, they started to lose their hearing, um, it would have really been nice to been able to communicate with them another way. Um, and so I kind of kick myself a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, I, I will change that going forward um, to make that something that I do more of with my dog. But, um, yeah, something to think about, you know. Uh, I know it sucks to think about your dog getting old and not being able to hear, but it's a reality. It, it will probably happen. So. Well, I, I, also, I think that brings a good point, not just with hand signals for dogs that – um, do have audible hearing. We've had a, quite a few in the past several years, um, some deaf dogs coming in for obedience training at Doggy Zone. And 
you know, those dogs can't hear traditional verbal cues and commands. So um, getting very creative with, you know, whether it's using the, the electronic collar, vibration collar, leash guidance, and hand signals with teaching those things. It's just, it's so awesome how we can work with these dogs in so many different ways. Yeah, we, we won't even go into tactile commands too much, but I mean, that's another, another thing is teaching the dog that when you touch them in a certain place that they're supposed to do something. Um, like I like to be able to just touch my dog at the base of their tail and know that it means to sit. So I just touch them there they drop their butt and that way if I'm talking to somebody and I don't want to stop talking, I can just reach over and just touch my dog at the base of their tail and drop into a sit. Yep. That's great. Um, we got a couple other uh, questions that came in here. How do you support a puppy when they're exposed to things that cause uncertainty? We had work being done on outside of the house. Bailey was barking like crazy with the banging of the hammer. Great question, and let's see if we can get you some uh, some feedback on this. Um, Just, you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. So it sounds like um, you know with some construction work going outside that Bailey was being really uncertain, barking like crazy at the at the sounds. Um, we always, uh, we, I mean, I always preach at the end of the day is that we have to get the dog focused on something, you know, obedience. And we'll probably sound like a broken record because I think we mention this every single call. Um, but if we're teaching the dog what to do in that moment, they cannot think about two things at the same time. They cannot multitask or multi-fail as, as some say. Um, you know, so when the dogs are going through these moments of having a, a tizzy, think about what is it, what is it that you want them to do? I'm, um, you know, naturally Buck earlier, you know, there was a, a big truck backing into the driveway. He's at the door like raw, 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 barking. And I, you know, his, his behavior disruptor is a, a big from out. Call him by his name. He turns and looks. I call him to heal. He comes. I tell him to lay down. You know, so the idea is that we have to work the dog through those frustrations. You know, it, it depends, though, is it if it's a constant thing or if it's just something that's slightly in the moment. You know, so I, I think getting the dog focused on something preferable. If the dog's off the leash, I would strongly encourage putting the dog on the leash to have a way to help them through that that systematic process. Because we have to, in order to change his behavior, we have to change the kind of the approach that we're doing. George, what would you advise uh, somebody to do or not do? Well, what I'm going to tell them not to do is try to make the dog feel a lot better with a lot of coddling. You know, it'll be okay, baby, because you are reinforcing not only what the dog is doing, but also their state of mind, which right then is in turmoil. Mm -hmm. So in nature, basically what would happen if it wasn't something that's going to kill them, mama would basically let them have a, hey, get a grip sort of attitude. They keep, mom keeps going with what's going, right? So while we don't want to punish the behavior like the barking, it's, it's just an indicator the dog's uptight. You know, I'm going to put the dog, I'm going to get the dog doing something else. Come on, let's heal. Let's go over and check it out. Sit down. That's a good pup. You sat for me. Here's your treat. So I'm rewarding the direction. So one thing I do tell everybody is if your dog, is faced with a direction on, or a, a choice on where to be or how to be. I can be upset or I can be something else. If you're not directing the dog 100%, they're going to do what comes natural to the dog. Yep. They're not going to do what you'd prefer them to do. So if, it, if it's natural for the dog to be a little uptight in that scenario and you don't tell them what to do, they're going to go to the upset part 100%. So... Um, in my attitude with that is to not have anything really change. Come on, let's go heal, you know, or whatever you're doing. I'm not going to stop and let them soak in it. If I'm healing down the road and they get upset about something, I'm going to keep healing down the road. It's not a thing, little dog. Look, we didn't even die. I say it all the time. Every day, everybody hears me say it 50 times a day. Look, you didn't even die, you know? <laughs> so, uh, that's how nature is, you know? And uh, that's how that builds courage and, uh, and, and confidence in that. They, that which does not kill them makes them stronger. But if they're thinking and imagining it's going to kill them and you let them soak in it, 
yeah, next time you're probably going to see the same thing. Hmm. Yeah, I think that there's also the fact that sometimes you just need to um, not try to to force a square peg in a round hole. Hmm. You know, we have dogs uh, all that come from a lot of varying different backgrounds, but you know, the question I would ask is, was your dog socialized around people banging on the outside of your house with a hammer? And if they weren't, then I would be asking myself the question, how likely is this to happen again in the near future? Is this something that is going to be a regular occurrence that I need to work on fixing this? Or is this something that maybe I should just take my dog and remove them from the situation because it's going to be less stress for them and less stress for you. Um, we frequently have people who don't typically would never put their dog in dog daycare because of whatever reason they have put their dog in daycare because they're having work done on the house. Um, I would tell you that this is probably a, a, a good reason to do it. A lot of our training clients um, who do that will you know, do our play academy program um, because it's, it's completely different than just a free for all pack play style program. Um, and so that being said, I think that's something that you have to look at is, is it really, are we trying to force the dog through or get the dog through a situation that's just not going to ever be okay, comfortable yeah. for them? Like what's, what is the point, uh, if we, if we have options of being able to just get the dog out of there, if it's short, Hey, let's go for a walk around the neighborhood. Uh, if we know it's an extended thing, like get the dog into you know boarding or daycare yeah. or, or whatever the case may be. And um, I think that that's an approach worth considering. You know, I, I agree with you, Andrew. There was a, a client that I was working with a couple of weeks ago, and in the lesson, they started to talk about you know how they're doing like a big family move from one house to the next, and you know, like stressing about like the dog and the situation behind that. And I said, well, lean on us for that. That is exactly what, what we're there for, you know, is that lean, lean on us, do a couple of nights of lodging, get the five-star activity package, like add on a, a bath so you have a clean dog going home into the new house. And don't, don't worry about like, don't let the dog be the stressor of the situation. And oddly enough, she goes, do you guys take kids too? And I was like, unfortunately, no, no, I can't do that. But lean on us. That's what we're here for. 100%. 100%. It's a comment from uh, Douglas Peter. Thanks to Doggy's Known Training, my mom was first scared of Rory. But after a few days, my mom was able to walk her and even sleep next to her in bed. Look how fast that happened. <laughs> Rory uh, is, is the girl. That's my girl. Oh, all right. That's what's up. That's what's up. And uh, yeah, we had uh, another comment from uh, Jennifer. Uh, her pet peeve <laughs> is when, when people tell their dogs down and they really mean off for jumping and, and it, it gets poisoned. Couch, person, bed, whatever the case may be. Yeah, that's uh, clarity. Yeah. Clarity, right? Super important. Uh, if you don't have clarity, then that's that's always going to be a uh, trouble. Who's, Listen, if you who stay hides back down our to one of my dogs on the, there on the couch, if you stay down, they're going to lay down right on a couch. And you say, good dog. That's right. Hey, who went, who did that, Andrew? Who hijacked our Facebook? I don't know. It, it's probably Matt. I bet it was Matt. Yeah. Well, we you, Matt. thanks, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, look, I, I had a good time talking to you, but I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. I'm exhausted. I've been on a day. Yeah, I got up really early this morning at four o'clock in the morning. I woke up and I'm like trying to get this house finished. And I was like, I got to go mount some doors. So I was like mounting doors at my four house. In the morning. You sound at, like me. She'll tell you it's not uncommon to pop around about three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm out there rebuilding a carburetor. Yeah, <laughs> it just happens sometimes. It happens yeah. sometimes. So anyways, well, um, of course, uh, thank you all for jumping on and joining us here this evening. We are looking forward to um, seeing you all again in about a month. Um, if you know somebody who could use their use some help with their dog, um, go ahead and share this with them. Uh, we would certainly appreciate that. And we look forward to seeing you all in about four weeks. Um, 
Yeah, uh, that's going to be interesting. We may end up not being at exactly four weeks and we may end up picking a different time. So keep your eyes peeled um, because my life is changing yes. like crazy right now. Yes. So, yes. Um, but you know what, Andrew? Don't worry about it. Jess and I got this. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I yeah. But, uh, to worry about. Oh, I know. I know. It's all, it's all in good hands. It's all in good hands. Well, anyways, folks, thanks for jumping on. Have a better than great night. And we look forward to seeing you in our new training zone real soon. I can't yeah. tell you how excited we are to get that started. And we will have more information for you soon. Just keep your eyes out for it. Have a good day.